Good morning, I'm Daisy of Green Blossom Painting, and I'd like to give you a quick summary of the three series that I've painted. We have the Seasonal Garden Calendar, the Natives and Pollinators, and our Keystone Species series. And so here's a Seasonal Garden Calendar, and in this calendar we have common name, scientific name, and the region to which they are native, because these are plants that are originally, uh, many of them are originally from other places in the globe. So here we have, for example, the garden geranium, which is a pelargonium, and it's of the family Geranaceae, though it's not actually of the genus geranium, and they're native to South Africa, where you can see them growing wild. In February, we start to think about um, what plants we're going to start from seed and which ones we're going to buy later as seedlings. And here we have uh, an Asian native and uh, two Central American natives. So, and in March, we start to see some blooms, uh, maybe some snowdrops and some winter aconite, uh, maybe some early crocus and early tulip. You can also use this calendar to make sure you have blooms every month of the year or nearly so. And you can also use it to coordinate the colors of your beds. Uh, maybe you want yellows and pinks, or whites and pinks, or whites and yellows early in the spring. And here are two Turkish natives and uh, a Central Asian native. Our apple blossoms start to pop in April. Siberian squill, not actually from Siberia, but from Southwest Russia and Turkey. And hellebore. And if you didn't know, these are actually the, not petals, they're sepals. So they're the things that cover the bud and protect the bud. The petals still exist, but they've receded um, over time to just a little cuff around the pollen. And we go through the rest of the months with our blooms uh, for each month, and also lots of garden tips inside the calendar itself. And we'll progress to the Natives and Pollinators calendar. This calendar has common and scientific names as uh, well as all natives to the United States. Um, and I worked with Spencer Hardy of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies to help learn some of the deep bee knowledge, um, which was new to me. And here we have the mock orange and the mock orange scissor bee. And the mock orange scissor bee sleeps in the stems of the mock orange and then emerges later to source its nectar and pollen. And again, we have our garden tips throughout the year to help remind us when to prune things and so forth. Um, here we have our blueberry cellophane bee and our blueberry bush and we have 4,000 native bees in the United States and the majority of them, not all, are specialist and solo bees. So they're um, solo queens doing their own egg laying, brood raising, and foraging all by themselves and because they're putting all that energy input um, into their life process, they don't have time that a colonial bee would have to go foraging for miles away. Um, so they're often specialists, meaning they get very good at, at pollinating one specific genus, for example, the blueberry bush. And our native bees have learned to buzz pollinate, which is where they grip the flower, buzz their wings really fast, and kick lots of pollen loose, more pollen loose than a European non-native honeybee would able, be able to do. And our honeybees are very important as well. They're um, very important to our food supply in pollinating that. So it's not like they don't have value at all, of course. Um, and I'm going to skip to another page where we have a butterfly. And this is our Carner Blue butterfly. She's federally endangered, she and he. Uh, why? Because... Um, we have been planting uh, the West Coast native lupin, Lupinus polyphilus, on the East Coast, where we also have an East Coast native, Lupinus perennis. And the West Coast native lupin comes in more colors and it's bigger, so it's a little bit more fancy to have in your garden. But the leaves are toxic to the caterpillars of the Carner Blue butterfly. So if you would like to help support the Carner Blue butterfly, you could also make some patches of the native lupin, um, Lupinus perennis, and feed their caterpillars. And so we go through, uh, there's butterflies and 
native bees and a few birds um, in our natives and pollinators calendar. And now we have our uh, keystone species calendar, which I did in a collaboration with Doug Ptolemy, who is an incredible entomologist and uh, studies butterflies and moths. And he has found that uh, the caterpillars of these butterflies and moths especially are particularly fond of our native plants. No surprise, they've co-evolved for millions of years and learned to adapt to the tree's defenses, usually a slight toxin in the leaves themselves. Um, and so they're particularly comfortable feeding on our native plants and they don't much care for non-native plants at all. So for example, our um, English ivy in Boston is, is not, um, not a food source to any native caterpillar. Um, whereas we could plant a different species and, uh, and, and feed caterpillars, um, which would then feed our bird populations, which are in uh, significant decline these days. You may have read, we've just lost about 3 billion birds just since 1970. Um, and so Doug Ptolemy has also found that there's about 20 genus, which he's called keystone species, which support about 90% of our caterpillars, meaning about 90% of our caterpillars can feed on just 20% uh, of our, our plant genus in the United States. So that is to say they could, uh, planting these can really kickstart an ecosystem and really give your ec ecology a boost. Um, not just the caterpillars themselves, which are turning the solar energy basic into cat basically into caterpillar lunch, but uh, for birds, so you're supporting birds and bats and all kinds of other creatures that, that feed on caterpillars. And so for example, we start with the black cherry, and the purple spotted, um, the red spotted purple is just one example of the hundreds of species that feed on the black cherry. There's about 400 Lepidoptera, meaning caterpillars, that can eat um, the black cherry. The black walnut. Another incredible source of food for caterpillars and habitat. Um, the royal walnut moth is a native to the eastern United States and a little bit to the western too, depending on the state. Um, absolutely gorgeous. I also made this caterpillar so I would start to learn which chrysalises and caterpillars were native and were good guys and which ones might eat my... <laughs> which ones might eat my vegetable crops and maybe it's okay if they eat a little bit of my vegetable crops but I didn't want too many of them around that kind of thing so um, uh, many depict the chrysalis as well as the caterpillar in order to make this calendar even more helpful to people who don't always have room to plant a tree um, Doug and I decided to include um, keystone pollen producing plants so the violet is one of them it's an early spring crop and uh, it's extraordinarily important for the Great Spangled Fritillary, which many of you have seen and love. Um, and uh, in the fall, the Great Spangled Fritillary is laying her eggs. They're hatching into caterpillars, and they will actually fast all winter long, not eating anything, until our violets come up. So um, I myself uh, for sure want to have a lot of violets coming up for my Great Spangled Fritillary. And I will skip ahead to June, where we have the pinnacle of keystone species. This is the oak tree, and it supports 500 different varieties of caterpillar, which is a huge amount of caterpillars. Um, and it's a huge resource to birds who are trying to feed their babies. Um, caterpillars are particularly important for growing birds um, because the mom and dad uh, need to very quickly source them and basically cram food right down the baby's throat and caterpillars don't have an exoskeleton like many other insects and uh, so they're particularly good food for baby birds and just to recap the in this case the caterpillars are being used as an indicator species for these keystones meaning there are many uh, important natives to our ecosystem and uh, caterpillars, is, uh, measuring how much caterpillars use each one is just one way to get a sense of um, what plants are really 
powerful in supporting an ecosystem. And I also made cards of each of these three calendars. I'll just flip through um, the keystone species one. So there's 12, 12 cards and they come in a set with uh, recycled envelopes, brown paper recycled envelopes. And uh, I hope you enjoy them all. Thanks again, and this is Daisy checking out from Green Blossom Painting.